Yeah, my name is Chris Dixon, and I live here in Ottawa, Ontario, on unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, and I'm a longtime organizer, and I also have a PhD. Um, I'm a sort of deprofessionalized academic, uh, and I, I focus on trying to build movements. And do you want me to say a bit about the work that I've been doing over the last few years? Yeah, just about this project, um, about where what we're going to talk about is coming from. Yeah. Um, so, over the last several years, actually as part of my graduate school work, I embarked upon a project of traveling around North America to several different cities and doing interviews with a bunch of different really smart, dedicated, long-time organizers to ask them questions about their work uh, and try and build some of the lessons and insights out of what we've all been learning. Uh, and so I've been working on this book project that comes out of gathering all of those interviews together. And as part of that, one of the topics that consistently came up in these interviews is the topic of leadership. And so part of what I take up and part of what was discussed in all these interviews is that topic. And that's those insights are really what lift up uh, what I've been presenting in workshops and what I'm talking about yeah. with you today. All right. So, so those insights, what, what makes it important why is it an important topic, leadership? Well, I mean, it's a complicated topic, right? Because there's this kind of prevailing conception of leadership. Like when I say the word leader, we tend to think about the one dude, the one really charismatic guy who compels everyone else and sort of in some way commands everyone else about what to do. And we, we see that model again and again, even in movement contexts. But definitely we see that in our workplaces. We see that in our governments. We see it in most of our lives, right? So it's important to talk about leadership because that's only one model of how leadership happens. And in fact, for flourishing uh, transformative movements, we need a much more robust um, model of leadership. And I think that that's already happening. I think people are beginning to develop that kind of model already. So we can get into it. You know, I think we can actually start to talk about that uh, and build our movements in the process. Yeah, and you had mentioned that there's different kinds of leadership. Can you, can you give an introduction to what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. So there's that first model I mentioned, right, of the sort of top-down leadership. But I actually think that if we look at the history of movements and we look at what people are actually doing right now in terms of grassroots organizing, we can see a different form of leadership, a kind of collective leadership that people are developing and struggle that isn't about that one person who's commanding and then having everyone obey. It's actually about people stepping up and using their different capacities to take initiative to help move groups forward and to actually help build our movements. And so I think of it as a kind of collective or anti-authoritarian sort of leadership. So um, because you're talking about this traditional leadership, which is what we're brought up with, and we either learn to follow that kind of leadership or, or be that leader, um, how do we learn these different ways of, of being leaders and leadership? Well, I think there are a lot of different ways that we learn different ways of doing leadership, but really one of the most important ways is by being explicit about developing leadership in our groups, in our organizations, in our movements. Because um, much of the time, we actually don't talk about it very much. Um, leadership just sort of happens, right? There are always people who are taking initiative to make sure that things occur. Um, but if we don't actually explicitly discuss that that's happening, then we can't transform it in any way, and we can't actually start to develop these more collective models, right? So the most important thing really is to start identifying how leadership is happening in our groups. Who is doing what kind of task? Some of those tasks are highly visible tasks, like speaking to the media, and some of those tasks are much less visible tasks, like doing child care for an event, or cooking the food, or doing some emotional caretaking for people in the group. Um, but those are actually all forms of leadership. Those are different ways that people are actually taking initiative to move the group forward towards its goals, right? Um, when we can start to identify what kind of leadership is happening, we can then start thinking about how do we build it? How do we actually help people develop the skills and the capacities to do those different kinds of tasks with confidence and competence? So I, I think that's actually how we begin to move forward in, in doing something that might be called leadership development work uh, for uh, transformative organizations. Yeah, so, so one thing is about recognizing what's going on, and another is about 
getting people to a place where they're they're confident and capable of um, of doing things. That's right. Yeah. 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 And it's it's actually those are two incredibly d difficult steps, right? Because the first one is actually about paying careful attention to what's happening in our groups, who's doing what kinds of work. And the second one, maybe even harder, is about figuring out ways that people can be trained to feel confident and competent to take things up and do them. Uh, and often that doesn't mean simply just saying, here's how to do something and then asking someone to do it. It means actually developing structures of mentorship where people work together, one person who's more experienced, one person who's less experienced, together doing a task and talking about how that task was done, evaluating their experience, and then a person who's newly learned a task, then training someone else how to do that task, right? Like, that's one mechanism for doing that kind of leadership development work. Are there other mechanisms? Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we can take tasks that one person currently does in a group and think about how we can rotate that task more. You know, a common way that this happens a lot is facilitation of meetings, right? That we say there's not going to be a permanent facilitator of every single meeting of our activist group. We're going to rotate that task. Different people are going to take turns doing that. But there's no reason why we can't do that with many, many other kinds of responsibilities that happen. Um, just for instance, childcare at meetings is something that I think can be rotated. It does mean that people have to be trained how to work and be with kids in fun and useful ways. But it, there's no reason that that's not something that can be rotated around in a group. Um, or setting up events, you know, doing the coordination tasks for making an event happen. That's again something that can be rotated around. There's no reason that one or a few people should just hold the one specialized skill set. But it does mean that people have to be trained so that they know how to do that sort of stuff. Yeah. What do you think is in the way of, of this kind of leadership development? What stops it from happening? Well, I think there are a few things. I mean, one is that this prevailing model of top-down leadership is kind of creates a groove that's very easy to fall back into over and over again, that we rely on one person or a handful of people and we look to them as, as always knowing what to do. Um, and we don't pay attention to the fact that lots of people are capable and lots of people are already doing things. Um, I mean, another thing that I think is important to mention is just the fact that our society is structured by systems of power and domination, right? White supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalist class relations, and other things too. And these also influence then how groups and movements are structured, and they definitely influence who feels skilled and confident enough to step up and take on some of the most visible leadership roles. So those kinds of systems themselves are blockages toward, in the way of building more collective forms of leadership, but we're, we have to contend with them. Yeah. So how do we do that? This is a very challenging task. I mean, part of it, again, to go back, is about recognizing the different kinds of things that people do, and then being very explicit and diligent in the kind of training that, that has to happen for people to feel confident and competent to step up. Um, and, and again, not throwing people into situations where they feel completely uncomfortable and unprepared to take on things, but actually providing the consistent support in our organizations so that people do feel able to step into uh, greater forms of leadership, like greater kinds of responsibilities. But it also means of being really explicit about the fact that why is it always that there are white men who are speaking to the media? Maybe we want to make some different designations around who's going to consistently speak to the media in our group. Because and we can't. There's no reason why we can't be more explicit in that way. Yeah. But it seems like this is like something that maybe, like you said, we fall back on what we're used to doing or what we're used to seeing. And um, I guess it's maybe about making it a priority and making sure there's a time for that. And that might have its problems because you're always trying to accomplish whatever the purpose of your work is. Oh, that's absolutely true, and I mean it's important to think about the way that so often in movements we're stuck in a kind of crisis mode of organizing, right? Where it's moving from one, responding to one emergency and then responding to another emergency. And that's, to be totally clear, there are lots of emergencies and crises in the world. The way that our social order is structured 
produces constant crisis for the vast majority of people so that a few people can experience almost constant security. But that doesn't mean that we have to constantly be operating in a crisis mode. If we want to have the long view, right, the long view of fundamentally transforming the system, then we do have to build in times when we pause in our work and actually assess what we're doing and think about how we can work more productively and effectively together and collectively. Any other thoughts? I don't, I don't think I have anything further to okay. add. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.